I, uh, as, as Bradley said, I'm a lawyer at Intel. Uh, I've been a participant in discussions uh, on the OSI mailing list about licenses for a long time, probably almost 20 years. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about a trend that some of us are seeing in copyleft licensing and to provoke you a bit to think about some things. Uh, that's why I have a somewhat provocative title to this presentation. Uh, I hope that some of you find what I say problematic or obnoxious and ask me questions or challenge me on what I'm about to say uh, because I want you all to think. So, first of all, the title of this thing, I said Boone or Bain, that's fancy lawyer talk, so I've, I've now changed it to good or bad. It's a little bit easier to understand, especially if English is not your first language. But uh, I wanted to start off talking about what is copyleft. I think probably most of us have an idea about this. Uh, most of us have probably read licenses that describe it, and you've probably read things that the FSF has said about copyleft, but I pulled this from the FSF website. This is literally the first sentence that they have in describing what copyleft is. And I've highlighted a section there that if read in isolation would essentially say copyleft is intended to cover all modified or extended versions of a program. Now, I have eliminated a lot of the explanatory material that came after that, but as a proposition, that's the first thing that it said on the FSF web website. Is it a question? Or are you just bothered by my flashing uh, display? Oh, okay. It looks like it's powering off now. All right. So uh, let me see if I can do this without slides. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Um, is it flashing? No, it's not flashing. Great. So um, if I were to take that first sentence at face value, I would say copyleft is essentially everything that can be copyleft is copyleft under a copyleft license. Now, I think most of you would understand that that's an absurd statement. And in fact, these licenses that we are all familiar with and use frequently are more complex than that and actually don't attempt to make everything copyleft. So let's go a little bit through the history of copyleft. I'm going to start off with GPL version 2. And to do this visually, I did it in the form of a pie chart. So in dark blue, if you look at GPL v2, there is a class of code that is required to be copyleft. However, there are written exceptions in the GPL version 2 that says these things are not copyleft. For example, code that you don't distribute. I think most of us know that that's a provision that GPL, or at least GPL v2. They also talk about code that is merely aggregated or things that are works not based on the program. We also learn through the GPLv3 process there's a class of things called installation information that GPLv2 does not address. So there's a bunch of stuff that GPLv2 doesn't capture, doesn't try to make copy left. So there's a pie and there are a bunch of slices in that pie that are not required to be copy left. Then there was an evolution of licenses. So the first evolution is this should say AGPL version 1. So AGPL version 1 comes out, and it takes a little slice from the non-distributed code section, and it puts it into copyleft. So that which is code that is accessed over the network in the AGPL, you do have to copyleft. So we've taken the pieces of pie that were outside of copyleft, We've taken a little slice off and we've added it back into the copyleft. There's another license OSL. Some of you may have read, uh, or those of you who know Larry Rosen, of course, have been pointed to this repeatedly. <laughs> Very similar to AGPL in terms of the slices that it says are copyleft and the slices that are not copyleft, written a little bit differently. Larry would argue that it's better written, but it's essentially kind of the same class of code that is copyleft and is not copyleft. So then we have GPL version 3. 
That comes out, and that adds some more stuff to the copyleft, specifically installation information, right? That was not something that was covered by GPLv2. GPLv3, it said you have to provide that uh, information uh, under copyleft. So as we can see, this evolution is happening. Little slices of the pieces of the pie that are outside of the pie are now getting put back into the pie. I will say this is a, another way of looking at GPLv3, alternative view of GPLv3. The GPLv3 at least makes explicit dynamically linked subprograms. So GPLv2 didn't say explicitly dynamic linking required uh, copy left. GPLv3 actually says that. So you could argue that that's another little slice of the pie that's getting put back into copy left. Nevertheless, what we're seeing here is an evolution where pieces of the pie, the, the blue pie is getting bigger, bigger by increments. Then we have AGPL version 3. And that takes all the little slices of pie that GPLv3 uh, had and puts those into the copy left. So the installation information, um, uh, dy dynamically linked subprograms, et cetera. So you're getting a slightly bigger pie, but you still have some slices of the pie that are kept outside of copy left. So I would say from that evolution, at least one hypothesis is that there has been an evolution of copyleft. So there are pieces of code that, if you look at GPLv2, were outside of copyleft that are getting put into copyleft. And that is a process over time that has occurred. More code is getting into copyleft as copyleft evolves. The, the evolution that we've seen has tracked business models or code perceived to restrict freedom. Software as a service, AGPL, is intended to capture some of that, to make copyleft some of that activity. TiVoization was something that both GPLv3 and AGPLv3 were, in, were designed to pull stuff in into copyleft. And depending on how you read GPLv2 versus GPLv3, dy dynamic loading and execution of subprograms. Now, if I take that hypothesis and I uh, extract from that, it looks like this evolution is continuing, but it's not clear what the end state of the evolution is. Is this going to continue? Should it continue? And where should it end? And I think that we start, may want to start thinking about defining what the end state should be. And, and, and I will talk a little bit about why I think we should start thinking about that, although some of you who saw the write-up of what this is about will understand why. Now, a couple of propositions about the process of looking at license or the evolution of licenses. This is my opinion, and I'm sure some of you will disagree with this, but in my opinion, if you're looking at a license, a new license, or an evolution of licenses, they should be evaluated solely on their fidelity to the standards of freedom and openness and the quality of their drafting and meeting those standards. I also believe experimentation is not necessarily a bad thing. So there may be new licenses coming out. Is that a bad thing? If it's a bad license, it's a bad thing. If it's a good license that evolves copyleft in a useful way, that's not necessarily a bad thing. The other thing I believe is the business model of the submitter should be immaterial to the evaluation of the license. And this is an issue, I think, that's, that's very uh, topical right now because we're seeing license submissions where people su uh, believe that the business model of the submitter is something that is bad or detrimental. I believe you should look at the license and whether it is a 
an appropriate evolution and it meets the standards of freedom, and whether it's submitted by somebody who's an angel or somebody who's got a business model that you think is bad should really be immaterial. Okay, so now let me talk about extreme copyleft. I mentioned that as the topic of this discussion. So the extreme end state of copyleft, if I take what I've got in my chart here, which is essentially what I said AGPL version 3 is, there's still a bunch of slices of the pie that are held outside of copyleft. Whoops, that, that got messed up in the translation. That should be circled around the, the uh, slices outside of the blue. But the question is, in extreme end state copyleft, should all of those slices come in? Should we get to the state that I described in the initial part of my presentation where essentially everything is copyleft that can be copyleft? That, I think, is the potential end state that we're headed towards or could be headed towards. Now, to that end, I have created something as a thought exercise which I'm going to call now Extreme Copyleft Public License. And I proposed this concept on the OSI mailing list six or eight months ago as a thought experiment. And essentially what I did is I kind of took BSD and then I put a copyleft clause at the end that essentially says, whatever rights that, I get, that you are using of mine the effect of exercising those rights must be copyleft, right? Everything that must be, co that is co that is, uh, must be copyleft is copyleft. Now, this is not a license proposal that I'm suggesting that anybody adopt or that the OSI approve or examine. It's a thought experiment. But I put it out there as something that people should think about not necessarily for legal drafting. I didn't, you know, go through this to ensure that the legal drafting was good, but to have people think about, is that a sort of license that comports with freedom and with the open source definition? I would contend potentially it does, and we should consider whether that is true or not and whether that's a good or bad thing. So... Here's my new license, and I get to the end state where everything that can be copyleft is copyleft. Now, I think that we're seeing licenses coming up that are, again, incrementally getting us closer and closer to end state copyleft. And there are three examples here, one of which uh, you're going to hear about next present presentation. And I don't know a whole lot about it, so I'm, I'm not going to disparage it or say that it's a, uh, an extension of copyleft that is significant. But there are three of them that have come up within the past two years on the OSI mailing list. The License Zero Reciprocal Public License was submitted in 2017 and then withdrawn in 2018 after a lot of negative commentary. And then I think most of you have heard the server-side public license was submitted last year to the OSI. Got a lot of attention, both in the press and on the mailing list. And it's currently still being reviews, reviewed and revised. I think it's on version three of the license at the moment. Uh, and then there's the Van Lindbergh's license, which uh, he talked about on the licensing list, and I think he's got it up on GitHub, and he's going to talk to you about it, but it's, I believe, another extension of copyleft. So we're seeing an evolution, or the evolution continue. More licenses being proposed to uh, extend copyleft further out than they, it currently is to capture code that under current licenses wouldn't be captured. Now, is this a good or a bad thing? Uh, you can look at it either way. And I think I, I would propose that you need to think a little bit about where you fall down on the good or the bad of this 
to get an understanding of how you feel about this process and where it's headed. So, the good. Could, potentially, you could say the good about further extensions of copyleft is potentially puts more code out as free or makes more code open. The downside of that, of extending copyleft further, is it potentially dec decreases code usage. If it extends it to a way that fewer people will be interested in using the license because they feel it, it, it overreaches or captures things that they feel they shouldn't have to copyleft, it may decrease the use of both that license and may maybe copyleft in general. The good about new licenses is it addresses new usage models, which is what GPL version 3 and AGPL, both version 1 and version 3, were intended to do. People said, hey, GPL v2 misses out on capturing certain things. We ought to have a new license to capture those things. The downside of that is you potentially create license embargoes or avoidance behaviors. And I think we, we heard at FOSDEM a little discussion about some companies say, I will not use this license. Actually, we heard that in the previous panel. Some people, some industries or some, certain classes of companies say, I don't like GPL version 3. I'm not going to use it because of the installation information requirement. Or I don't like AGPL, either version, because I don't like the requirement to copy left uh, code that is accessed over a network. That may or may not be a good thing, depending on how you look at it. Maybe you say, well, they shouldn't play in copyleft if they're not willing to live by the rules. Or you could say, that's reducing the potential users of copyleft that might be willing to use copyleft, but because of certain provisions or the extension of copyleft in the licenses, they wouldn't. Another thing that this does is it tests the boundaries of the free software definition in the OSD. This is one that's of particular interest to me on the OSI mailing list because I think s many of these licenses uh, are potentially violative of either the letter or the spirit of parts of the OSD. And that's something that uh, generally shouldn't be approved by the OSD, but when there is ambiguity, or the, the, they're attempting to test that ambiguity, that may not be a bad thing. It may help us all understand what we think openness or what we think freedom is when we test cases that push against some of these definitions. And then finally, there's, there's uh, some good that may come of this is that you test boundaries of intellectual property rights. So we start looking at yeah, we start looking at uh, collective works. How can collective works and copyright potentially be used to extend copyleft? We could look to derivative works. Are there ways to increase the expanse of derivative works into copyleft? We can look at contributory copyright infringement as a mechanism to extend copyleft rights. There are any number of different intellectual property regimes that could potentially be used as a mechanism to extend copyleft through proposed license grants. The downside of that is you potentially create precedents that may be overall bad to copyleft licensing in general. So, there are good and bad here. I think everybody should Think about these issues. You should get in your own mind your idea of how far copyleft can go or should go. Um, I would encourage those of you ha who have the time and the interest to monitor the discussions that are happening about these licenses. And if you feel strongly about them, about either the manner in which copyleft is being extended or the way the licenses are being written to do that, that you make your voice heard. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a lawyer to do that. Uh, developers are, should be welcome to voice their own opinions about where they think copyleft should go or what the boundaries of copyleft are. 
The unfortunate problem in the process that the OSI has is there are about 10 or 12 of us with very loud voices who speak up and give our opinions and there are many people who don't. And that doesn't necessarily lead to optimal review and consensus. You're getting the consensus of a very narrow group of people. You're not necessarily getting the consensus of a broad group of people, which may indicate that the consensus is deeper or broader than is potentially what appears from the mailing list. So having said that, uh, I don't have any solution here. I think all of us need to think about what we feel on these issues, but you should make your voices heard, and you should think a little bit about what you think copyleft is or should be and whether you think there are any limits that should be put upon the extent to which copy left may extend. So that's all I got for today. I've probably got five minutes for questions if anybody has them. Yeah, we have about six minutes for questions. Folks who are watching the stream, which I'm told is working now, uh, can uh, do so on IRC Pound Conservancy. And I'll start with Fontana because his hand went up first. So McCoy, he, he's one of the guys who talks on the mailing list, by the way. I try not to. <laughs> um, can you explain why you think that the business model of the licensed drafter should not be a relevant consideration? Which is something that I think Bradley Kuhn has disagreed with recently. Yes. Um, I, I think the mailing list is designed to look at licenses and to evaluate whether licenses fall within the boundaries of what we as a community believe is free so software or open source software. Uh, and recall that there were a number of companies uh, and there may still be companies who use GPL as a mechanism to uh, pursue uh, business models that a lot of people found offensive. Query whether that would have killed or called into question GPL because people were using it in that way. So I generally think that the process ought to be somewhat neutral as to the submitter and really should uh, relate to the text rather than the party presenting the case. But again, others here disagree or may disagree and I certainly respect that disagreement and certainly if you think uh, any particular entity is uh, malign, there is nothing wrong with saying that as part of your objection. Simon. Um, so recently OSI uh, adjusted the license approval process to indicate we were aware that the OSD may have some weaknesses. Uh, what we did was we said that we would, uh, that the, our first priority was to check that the license delivered software freedom. Um, that's now the headline item on, the, uh, on, on our review uh, criteria. Uh, and, and I'm very keen that we find ways to open up the conversation to more voices who can contribute to the license review process. I wonder if you have any proposals or suggestions for how we could do that in a way that doesn't make the, uh, the, the forum less accessible to people. Um, I, I would suggest that uh, venues like this or other venues where like-minded individuals discuss these topics is a recruitment grounds for other voices. Um, you know, beyond that, what degree of outreach you think you need to do, uh, you know, at some point you can, you know, you, you wind up getting nothing but trolls, so you need to avoid that, but uh, the optimal way to get the right voices in is a tricky problem. So I, could you skip back to your extreme copyright license, which I absolutely loved, by the way. I thought that was, that is. Well, that is, feel free <laughs> to use it on your next project. No, no, it's. it's Although, <laughs> I, no, I, I may I, opine I, about its I, poor I drafting it. if you do. I, I love it because 
In what way is this different to copyright XXX Corporation, all rights reserved? Isn't this just the mirror image of that? So imagine that you had a, a, a group of people who essentially chose that as the license for their software. Aren't they com as just within their rights to do that and be as extreme as that as a corporation is to say, copyright XXX, proprietary all rights reserved? Right. First of all, all rights reserved is a historical anachronism that you should not use going forward. But put, putting that aside, that's not really a license. That's essentially saying I have copyright in, on this and you have no rights to do anything with it. So th that would be the extreme uh, copyright. You're right. Essentially, I pass along no rights to you. So this you know, potentially is, or I could have just said all rights reverse, but uh, you know, that would be copyright infringement of somebody else. I, I'm reminded of a, a phrase I heard once that if you get so radical, it actually swings back around to reactionary. Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> Um, so I was just wondering, you're, you said that you didn't think the business model of the proposer of the license should matter, um, but putting that aside, how much do you think like the practicality of the license should matter? So um, perhaps someone proposes a license where it's basically impossible for anyone else to comply with it, um, and is essentially, like as a matter of fact, a licensing trap, just because of the facts today. Maybe 15 years from now, it would be different, but should OSI approve a license that today is not practical for people to comply with? I think that's a question that needs to be asked. Now, now there are some limitations. The OSD puts limitations on the sorts of licenses that could be approved. So that definition already puts limitations. But let's say that it was fully compliant with the OD, OSD, but everybody says this, this is such a, a comprehensive license that it is unlikely that anybody would ever want to use it other than the proponent of it. I think that's something that ought to be discussed about whether that is something that really is open source. So Ian here will be the last question. Uh, in your list of bad things I didn't see the term license proliferation which is uh, one of the first things that comes to mind as, uh, for many reasons, uh, a, a bad that I think OSI talks about as well. Why I was wondering why you didn't mention that or what your thoughts were. So, uh, uh, so uh, just just hi historical. I sat on the license proliferation committee of the OSI in like 2001. Uh, I, 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 I thought that license proliferation was a problem back then. Uh, I'm not sure that I b believe that anymore. But uh, this is coming from somebody who works in a big giant corporation with lots of people who have the capacity to review an infinite p potential number of different licenses to evaluate whether they are suitable or not suitable for the work that we are doing. So maybe my perspective is skewed from, say, a company which has 100 employees, maybe one lawyer, and doesn't want to have to look at 50 different licenses to figure out whether they're a problem or not. So uh, reasonable minds may vary on that one. And I, th I think the community of people who look at these licenses have a lot of different opinions on whether license proliferation is a problem or not.